I'm here with Andrew Liveris, who's the CEO of Dow Chemical. Um, welcome to One Portland Place and uh, the Institution of Chemical Engineers. Thank you, Helen. So. Pleasure. <laughs> um, first of all, congratulations on being awarded ICME's Georgie Davis Medal um, for services to chemical engineering. Thank you. So that's it's an honour. <laughs> um, you are obviously a fellow of the institution and um, you started out life as a graduate chemical engineer. I did. And you've worked your way all the way up to being the CEO of one of the world's largest chemical which is pretty good going and obviously why you've received your medal. <laughs> How has chemical engineering and the chemical engineering background that you have helped you in your business career? Well, I must say that uh, as a young chemical engineering undergrad and finally becoming an employee of Dow Chemical, uh, I could never have imagined even having the chance to answer that question because <laughs> you don't really start out when you're in you know, the early days of your career working in the plants or working in R&D labs. I mean, chemical engineering from a skill set point of view makes you inquisitive, gives you problem solving capabilities, enables you to work in teams, uh, lets you know a lot about experiments and data and tells you a lot about what to believe in and what not to believe in. It really helps fine tune your sense of intuition. You know, you, this is the, where's this gonna lead to? What's around not one corner, but what's around two corners? You develop what I call uh, 360 uh, vision, which is you get a sense of things coming from all directions. And there's a certain chaos to the world of chemistry, but humanity has pretty much figured out how to tame uh, most of that chaos through basically studying processes and being predictive and analytical on how to you know, actually get answers. And frankly, the world of business is also full of chaos. And you know, <laughs> what chemical engineers, I think, bring to the table and what I certainly learned over the years is really just bring those same skills to the problem that's in front of you. And don't be phased by the problem. I mean, some people might run from problems. I think chemical engineers like to go to problems and, yes. and get to the solution. And if the solution is not adequate, get the better solution. So you're improving all the time. Um, over these many years that I've had the privilege of having this great career at Dow and ultimately the CEO spot, I never really changed the approach, just applied it to different problem sets. Yeah. Um, you are now chairman of the Business Council for the next two years. Um, what exactly will that entail for you, and what do you hope to achieve in your time as chair? Well, it's an extracurricular role, so, you know, frankly, it's an honor to help lead the United States business community to dialogue with the um, very important partner in government and, for that matter, in civil society. And in, in the world of business and the U.S. Business Council, which is really the Fortune 500 CEOs, uh, it's a pretty big privilege to be asked to be the chair for two years. I'm the first foreigner elected to that position and so I you know when I got the job I think what really made me a good candidate is I come from mainstream manufacturing and manufacturing is making a comeback yeah. and you know we've talked about that and I, I would tell you that this whole notion that really our world is getting fairly unpredictable but when I manufacture when I look at the world of manufacturing it's jobs it's value add intellectual property rich, high technology content. A lot of great architecture can be pulled around that from a policy framework point of view, tax, regulatory, energy, etc. So those intersections uh, between government, business, and civil society, uh, as chair of the Business Council, we're putting together lots of uh, meetings and policy statements that will be very helpful. At uh, the very first meeting we had a few weeks ago, President Obama himself showed up and uh, gave us a whole evening and uh, we had a really great dialogue with him and his team for the two days we had the meeting in Washington. I'm hoping that um, I can also help uh, with the, my leadership team, the executive committee, educate the normal average American about business. Yeah. I'm sure it's true here in the UK and for that matter around the world that Hollywood portrays business and CEOs in particular as bad people who do bad things and uh, I think the modern day press uh, likes a headline and doesn't get into the story. And so education uh, of the, what the business community does for humanity, I think is another thing I'd like to achieve. Yeah. Um, one of the things, you've, obviously as a business leader in the States, you've been quite outspoken in some of your views. And recently you've been a vocal opponent of large scale gas exports, which is a big topic um, at the moment in the US. Um, why do you think this is such a terrible idea for the US economy? Well, the part about being vocal goes with the Australian Territory, so you just have to forgive me my nationality. I've never really changed uh, uh, being fairly direct and fairly open about views of 
importance. And um, when you get a podium, use it. And we have a very important podium at Dow. We are the U.S.'s largest energy consumer as a single entity, something like 20 to $25 billion a year worth. So you might imagine my company and I have a view on the cost of those inputs. And uh, what's very important uh, for the nation uh, and for Dow is that we have a balanced view to export. So rather than export all of it internationally, you know, just literally in the first five minutes of owning all of this gas, this gas is a very latter-day uh, phenomena which has just been discovered. So if we have 100 years of supply, why would we want to export it all in the first five years? And should we not look at the knock-on effects to the economy, to consumers, the price of power, the price of transportation, uh, the price of goods? Should we look at exporting some finished goods, not just liquids? So instead of converting it into a liquid and shipping it to nations around the world and then letting them make the goods and shipping them back to America? Should we not look at the value add inside the US economy? Should we not look at the jobs that would create? At last count, there is $96 billion of investment on the books for the United States, all in value add industries, creating 5 million new jobs. So I'm not against free trade. I'm actually for free trade. I'm as capitalist as any CEO would be. But for a national policy, let's look at balance. How much should stay domestic? How much should be allowed to be exported? And let's crawl, walk, run through that conversation rather than rush through the first financial door that gives us the quick fix. Now, that's a balanced view. It's not an extreme view. No. But I know the other side of the debate likes to put me up as the extreme view. And hopefully an interview like this might explain why it's a balanced view. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, there's an independent report published by the Department of Energy lately said that shale gas export would benefit the US economy. Do you disagree with that or is this all going back to balance? It's the balance question and that report was fatally flawed. Charles River Associated, Associates put it together. Uh, there's been since another report put together and the difference between the first and the second report uh, is the word balance and the reason the first report didn't get it right is they froze demand as of 2010. Well I just mentioned to you 96 billion dollars and 5 million jobs is demand that's going to occur between now and 2020. So before you say there's enough to export, should you not look at the new demand that's occurring? It seems like a fairly simplistic thing to look at as an example of a flawed report. And not just us, many other companies have looked at that report and said, that's not right. And I testified in front of Congress, so I was willing to put it under oath yeah. to say what I just said to you, which is that, look, the second report speaks about balance and that happens to be our view. So what do you think are the main benefits of not exporting shale gas? Jobs, jobs, and jobs of the right kind. Uh, we're living in a world where joblessness is becoming an epidemic. Uh, the youth of today has less jobs to look forward to than they did the previous generation. And that's the benefit of technology. We are more productive. We've figured out through automation and robotics how to not use human beings as much as we used to. Uh, the low-skilled labor side of the equation is disappearing as countries move up the economic pyramid. So at the end of the day, you know, we do need jobs for this new type of population and demographic. You know, it's wonderful to have all the gadgets. It's wonderful to have a modern society. But if you don't have work, you don't, can't pay for them. So I'd imagine economies and politicians in today's world should be thinking thoughtfully about what sectors of their economy could create tomorrow's jobs for tomorrow's generation and so that we can create economic growth. And I would tell you that value add technology rich intellectual property uh, uh, thick industries are great jobs. The chemical industry is one of the highest paying uh, industries in the United States. And high paying, lots of jobs for a modern America in the world of chemistry, I would think would be wanted. So let's not rush out the door and just export gas. At the end of the day, refrigerating something is highly complex, but I do it in my freezer every day. So, <laughs> so one step of value add is hardly enough jobs. So let's do the entire value add. Let's go all the way to making cosmetics, to ceiling tiles, to floor coverings, to automotive parts, to aerospace parts, to water filtration, to medical devices. All of that by closing the value chain between raw material and finished goods. As I said, five million jobs in the US in the next five years alone. Indeed. 
Well, that's obviously manufacturing, which is what you were talking about tonight, I understand. Uh, talking about manufacturing opportunities and your vision that could revolutionise the UK and European, the European process industries. So, in a nutshell, what exactly will, we, will you be telling us about tonight? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I've been saying to my colleagues that the term advanced manufacturing didn't exist three years ago. What, what existed was this notion that manufacturing was dead not just in the UK, but also in the US, that modern society inevitably does not need manufacturing. That's for the low-end technology people. So textiles, footwear, leather, you know, basic manufacturing, smokestack industries. Yet under our very noses, we were building advanced manufacturing sectors like information technology, like how to actually do sophisticated medical equipment. The Germans were teaching us how to do sophisticated engineering equipment. So high IP rich, intellectually rich, uh, advanced manufacturing sectors, how do you innovate to get the ideas into commercial production to allow new jobs for a modern economy? Advanced manufacturing therefore brings lots of policies together to make that happen. It also is about choices, not winners and losers for companies, but winners and losers for sectors. Do you want an advanced transportation industry in the UK? Do you want an advanced aerospace industry in the UK? Do you want an advanced anything industry in the UK? Well, what is the UK good at? What is the US good at? Inventory what we're good at, and then build the capability around it just like a business would. By the way, this is what non-democratic countries are doing all the time. When I go around the world, and instead of getting, you know, when I get invited, I get red carpet. Why do they give me red carpet in these countries? Because they want what we have in these advanced economies. When I go to the advanced economies, I get red tape, okay? And what they, they're telling me is, I don't actually don't want you anymore because you're complicated, okay? You, you, you need to be regulated, you need to be, you want an energy policy, you want a tax policy. Well, I'm not gonna subsidize you. We're not asking for subsidy. We're asking for, where's your thought on the next generation of industries? How do I build my human capital, my talent pipeline? How do I recraft my craftsmen at community colleges and apprenticeship schools? How do I build a whole supply chain of small and medium enterprises for these sectors? In the modern economies, industrialized, Western, Germany has got it right. The UK is very interested in this conversation for the obvious reasons. Because the UK lost its manufacturing base after being the inventor of the Industrial Revolution. The UK decided all it wanted was services, and that didn't work out too well a few years ago. And diversifying the UK economy is a national priority, and I think it's a sweet spot for advanced manufacturing. Andrew Lewis, thank you very much for speaking to us. Thank you, Helen.